Hey folks, this is Gunny XI, welcoming you right back to Let's Play Humanico. This is episode 72. In the last episode, we actually wrapped up the main the main part of episode 4, I guess, the fourth arc. Um, but what we're going to be doing today is what unlocked, which is the Tea Party episode 4. Um, and then I assume that'll unlock episode 4, the question marks thingy. I can't really remember from the last time we played. So, <laughs> so here we go. Let's see how the Tea Party turns out. I'm going to try and do it all today, by the way. All of the both of them. I don't know how long it's going to end up, but we'll see. The second day, October the 5th. Ooh, okay. After all the killings. Guess that makes sense. In the Rose Garden. Are we actually in the Rose Garden or is it just taking us somewhere? Ooh. Oh wow, it's nearly midnight the day after. I don't have a clue what's going on. Please, someone explain in a way even I can understand. What happened yesterday? I was in the kitchen of the mansion, grabbing some food without permission. If you open up that massive business class refrigerator, you can find anything. You can eat and drink as much as you like. Even if the typhoon didn't clear up for a week, I'd have more than enough to eat. With wine in one hand, I was helping myself to some dry cured ham. I wonder just how expensive this wine and ham are. You ingredients are out of luck too. If only you'd had Goda San to cook you. You could have been reborn as much more incredible food. <laughs> could have been revived. <laughs> I looked at the clock. Very soon it would be midnight. October 5th, the second day, would end. The insane October 4th yesterday seemed like a lie. That's how much nothing had happened after that test thing. Nothing happened. No phone call came, no letters came, no person came and no one attacked me. Nothing happened at all. I want to start demanding a refund on all the time and energy that tension stole from me. Because after that, for an entire day, a full 24 hours, nothing happened. So surely, nothing's going to happen now. A full 24 hours ago. Beatrice called me to the spot in front of the mansion's entrance. There, I was given a strange test to determine the successor to the headship or whatever. I gave a serious answer in my own way, but it somehow hadn't meshed with the other side. Beatrice got pissed off for no reason and fell silent. I yelled at her to try and say something, but she gave no answer. Battler then, okay. So is him stuck in the game, is it after she left, kind of thing. When I asked where Maria was, she just told me to go to the chapel, and left. To tell the truth, there was an anticlimax. No matter what kind of weird test you give, at least tell me whether I've passed or failed. You're trying to say, thanks for coming, your results will be mailed to you later, or something? Quit messing with me. Anyway, I then headed to the chapel. After failing their tests, both George and Nikki and Jessica were killed. I couldn't let Maria get killed too. Also, I might get a chance to catch some person trying to kill her. As a little kid, I often heard from Jessica that you'd get in trouble if you went near the chapel. So I'd never been there, but I at least knew where it was. I couldn't find any trace of a person there. But there was a key bundle lying in front of the door. I thought this might be someone telling me to open the door, but after trying all the keys, I found that none of them fit. I also called Maria's name, but there was no answer whatsoever. I searched around the chapel, but there was a limit to what I could do in the pitch black with just a flashlight. I realised that this key bundle might be a set of master keys, which could make it possible to open the door to the mansion. I found no sign of Maria, so I returned to the mansion. The mansion was wrapped in silence, and in a horrible stench. However, it's amazing how good humans are at adapting. The inside of the mansion must still be wrapped up in that smell. However, I grew completely used to it and stopped minding it. It didn't seem any worse than any old house where someone had burnt some meat. At first I was bewildered by the stench, but I decided to head to the dining hall for the time being. And found those corpses that were so pitiful, Godasan and the rest had hesitated to speak of them in detail. It was the remains of Aunt Natsui and the others who had become the first victims. Half of each head had been completely split open, and it was so gruesome that even without knowing a thing about examining corpses, I could say that they were 100% dead. And on top of that, the remaining halves of their faces were left like normal, so it was even easy to identify them. Really convenient corpses these were. And in addition to those six bo bodies, was one more. The seventh corpse was Maria. I, th I thought she passed her test with flying colours, Kinzo said. She lay next to Aunt Rosa, as though sleeping alongside her. I cried. 
at the death of an innocent young girl, and at the cruel way my dad and the rest had died. I raced through the mansion, swinging the hat stand spear, yelling, Come out here, bastard! But I couldn't find any trace of anyone else. Thinking they might be planning to hide somewhere and attack me from behind, I went around searching for hiding places, sometimes growing more cautious, and sometimes intentionally letting my guard down in various ways, but in the end, not even a kitten appeared. Then morning came, my tension and fatigue combined with my drowsiness, making for the worst kind of dawn. Humans are pretty incredible. Even when a murderer might be hiding somewhere, we prioritise drowsiness and fatigue over our own lives. By that time, I started to feel pretty ridiculous. After all, for a full six hours before dawn, I'd walked around the mansion, yelling at the culprits to show themselves. My search had been a careful one, and I'd tired myself out and let my guard down. Even so, no one came to attack me. Basically, I lost patience with them and figured they could do whatever the hell they wanted. The boat won't come until the typhoon passes. They said on TV that it won't pass until tomorrow, so I've got another full day today. Lazing about lost its interest, and even though I knew it would probably make the police mad, I decided to play detective a bit. First was the dining hall, where the very first murder had occurred. The six who had been killed in the beginning really were pitiful. The weapon used was probably a gun. Maybe their heads were split by something powerful, like a magnum bullet or shotgun. It was a reasonable theory to hold. Compared to that, the seventh corpse, Maria, had died in a much better and cleaner way. At a glance, I could see no external wounds and didn't understand how she'd been killed. But by her mouth were traces of bubbles that she might have spat out. And it looked like a typical death by poisoning that you might see in a TV drama. Wasn't Maria called out to the chapel and given a test? So why was she in the corpse-filled dining hall, lying next to her mother, dead? Even if the cause of death was poison, who gave it to her? Her clothes weren't disturbed at all. It's hard to imagine that she was forcibly pushed down and given an injection of poison. It's probably better to assume that she was given a capsule of poison or something and made to swallow it. But compared to the scattered and violently mutilated corpses in this room, Maria's corpse was too clean. If they had a gun, they only needed to pull the trigger. But poisoning, whether by having her drink it or by an injection, would take a lot more effort. Considering the culprit's brutal nature, you'd think Maria's death alone was given special treatment. Why was only Maria given a sleep like death? True, being killed is always a pitiful thing. But for some reason, Maria's death alone seemed very courteous to me. Both of Maria's hands were joined on her chest, as though the dead person had put them there herself. Did Maria do that herself before dying? Isn't this usually something done by someone else after the person dies? As though sleeping with her mother, whose head was half crushed, Maria dozed in peace. For some reason, that contrast really bugged me. Including the direct cause, it's probably safe to say that Maria's death is shrouded in mystery. And more than anything else, the biggest mystery of this dining hall was the pitfalls. The pitfalls that both Uncle Krause's group and Goda Sands had mentioned. After the first six were killed, five more fell through pitfalls and were captured. What are pitfalls? Those things that suddenly open and you fall through them, right? The room had a solid floor with a carpet that looked dignified, if a bit worn out. No matter how you looked at it, it was single piece. If a pitfall had opened up, there would have been a seam just in that place. And if there had been some trick like a pitfall, wouldn't it creak when you walked on it? No matter how much I walked around, feeling the carpet, I just couldn't imagine that a pitfall was hidden there. Anyway, it'd be one thing if a single person fell, but a full five people did. By putting together everyone's stories, each one of them had fallen from a different location, so at the very least, there had to be five separate places with pitfalls. So what's this mean? Was this room actually made with pitfalls across the entire floor? So by pushing a button, you could open up a pitfall in a location of your choice? Some kind of contraption like that? That kind of ridiculous mechanism would be surprising even in a ninja mansion. But if Dad and the rest had heard about this, I wonder if they'd say, I wouldn't put it past Grandfather to do it, to make it. At any rate, I didn't learn anything more from the dining hall. Do the pitfalls not exist? Or do they exist but I just can't find them, amateur that I am? I can't say for sure. Since I claimed that the pitfalls were there, I can't ignore them, even if I can't find them. The next ones to be killed were Jessica and George and Iki. 
I discovered Georgianiki when I'd been called out for my test. He'd been called out to the arbor in the rose garden, and probably shot in the forehead with a gun. Jessica had been called to her own room on the second floor of the mansion. The door to her room was locked, but that wasn't a problem at all since I had a master key. Inside the room, it was horrible, but after the dining hall, I was used to corpses, so I'd built up a bit of an Im immunity. The phone receiver was loose and dangling. Had she been killed while still on the phone with me? Jessica was leaning against the wall right next to it, with half her head split open. As far as I could tell by glancing at the scene, it looked as though she'd been killed while on the phone. In that case, had the culprit been right there before her eyes? I hadn't gotten that impression when listening to Jessica's voice over the phone. Pretty sure Jessica said, they got me. It's probably best to assume that she'd already received a fatal wound at the time of the phone call. That's right, and she also said this, when you come battler, I'll be a corpse with half its head split open. That's what she said. From what I could tell by looking at Jessica's corpse, there were no wounds on her other than the damage on her head. Could she have, been, could she have had an injury serious enough to make her prepared for death, and then died halfway through the phone call? But the way she talked on the phone made me think that she'd escaped harm for the time being. You shouldn't be able to have a casual conversation over a phone if the culprit's right before your eyes. So did the culprit come in partway through the phone call and kill Jessica? No, that can't be right. After all, this room was locked. That doesn't tell me anything. If the culprit stole the master key from one of the victims, locking the door would be meaningless. But she had no external wounds other than her head. In that case, should I assume that the fatal wound she was prepared to die from and the actual external wound that damaged her head were two different things? and that both of them were made to the same part of the body. In other words, Jessica was stuck severely to the head and received an incredibly bad wound. Then she called me and either lost consciousness or died while on the phone. Then the culprit came and damaged her head again. Something like that. After being called to this room, Jessica was attacked by the culprit and received a serious injury. Then the culprit thought she'd been killed, and went away for the time being. But Jessica miraculously started breathing again, and called me with what would become her dying message. Then the culprit realised that they'd failed to kill her, and rushed back to deliver the final blow, after Jessica fell unconscious from massive blood loss. That seems to add up, more or less. Except for how Jessica was able to accurately predict the nature of that final blow. And there was one more thing that bugged me about the phone call from Jessica. Jessica had said this. George Nissan's done for too. That was an instant death. She said it almost as though she'd witnessed Je George and Nikki being killed. But while you certainly could see the rose garden from the window in Jessica's room, and you could even see the roof of the arbor where George and Nikki had been summoned, it was very far away. Add on the fact that it was the night of a typhoon, it's very hard to imagine that she was able to witness everything that happened by the arbor from this window. And more than anything else, Jessica left before George and Iki. So she shouldn't have known that George and Iki's test took place by the arbor. Why did Jessica know that George and Iki had been killed? Also during my search of the entire mansion, I found Kirie-san's corpse as well. It was in one of the old guest rooms at the back of the first floor. In the past, before the construction of the guest house, the relatives had spent the night in these. Curious Anne's situation matched Jessica's perfectly. She'd probably been killed during a phone call with me. The receiver was hanging untidily, and Curious Anne lay crumpled in that corner. But the way she'd been killed was very different from Jessica. Her head wasn't smashed. Instead, a stake with knockout design was buried into her forehead. It was so gruesome, so I pulled it out. After pulling it, I realised that they might get me into trouble with the police later. So a little too late, I set it down by Kyrie's side. Its tip was sharp and stained with enough blood that it must have penetrated fully to the brain. It didn't know. I didn't know what kind of metal it was made of, but it was about as heavy as a paperweight. Certainly, if you were stabbed all out with something like this, it might cause a terrible wound. I probably knew what that stake meant. It's one of those, the style of killing from the fourth twilight onwards in the Witch's Epitaph. It's probably that gouge with a stake and kill thing. However, a human skull is very firm. No matter how much someone mustered their strength, could it really have been pierced so neatly? No, 
By my reasoning, this stake wasn't the cause of death, but had just been used to damage the corpse after death. She was probably killed with a gun or something, like George and Iki, and the stake had been stuck into the hole left by the gun. Thinking of it that way makes it easier to accept. But was Kiri san really killed with a gun? As she said on the phone, even though she was holed up inside the locked room, Kiri san was being attacked. In fact, this room had been locked. Also, she mentioned a golden thread or something flying in and attacking her. In fact, there were four places around Kiri san's corpse with holes that could have been caused by some kind of attack. But a golden thread attacked her through the keyhole? I looked at the door from Kiri san's perspective. If it had been one of those old keyholes you see in old mystery movies, where you can peek through to the other side, then it would clearly have been possible to stick, through some, uh, stick something through it. But even though the doors in this mansion were old fashioned, the locks were the familiar average cylinder style that you could find in any normal house. In other words, they weren't constructed in a way that would let you penetrate through them. So no matter how thin an object you might try to stick through the keyhole, it's unthinkable that something penetrated through from the outside and attacked. A cylinder lock. And a keyhole. But despite that, Kiryasan definitely said that something like a golden thread had flown in through the keyhole, spun around while aiming for her and attacked her. A golden thread attacking through a keyhole. I couldn't understand what it meant at all. But even so, Kiryasan probably predicted that I wouldn't be able to understand all this. And it wasn't just Kiryasan. Jessica said it over the phone too. No, since the very beginning, from the time we talked with Goda-san and Kumasawa-san, and got the phone call from Uncle Krauss's group, everyone had said the same, consistent thing. Grandfather summoned witches and demons, and is killing people with magic. They've been shown that right before their eyes. These weren't tricks or fakes. There was no choice but to believe it. With one voice, they'd all said that. When the mystery woman calling herself Beatrice appeared, even I had pretty much believed that she was a real witch, and might start summoning goat monsters right and left. However, after being left alone for a whole day, my feeling of tension had faded completely. I was now able to think that something so stupid definitely couldn't be true. But they lo did they lose their heads a little in an extraordinary situation where their lives were exposed to danger, and mistakenly think that a witch was attacking them with magic? But multiple people gave the same kind of testimony, and on top of that, none of their opinions conflicted each other. If it had just been a single statement, I'd be able to suspect that they just didn't see what they thought they saw, but doing that now is pretty difficult. Then right next to the back door, I found Uncle Krauss with his head half smashed. Even though he'd escaped the dungeon of Corridorian, and somehow made it this far by a secret underground passage, he'd been killed. Buried into the gruesome cross-section of his half-crushed skull was a stake with knockout design, like the one that had been buried into Kiryasan's forehead. And in this situation, it was very hard to imagine that the stake was the weapon used. He had been killed with a powerful gun, like the six in the dining hall, and after death, had been jabbed with a stake like Kiryasan. One of the golden threads that Kiryasan spoke of attacked Uncle Krauss too. Does there exist some kind of tool, like an endoscope, that's very thin but can be moved about at will? And that can also attack people? No way, I've never heard of anything like that. But even so, if this fact had been revealed to one of the relatives, maybe they'd say I wouldn't put it past grandfather to make it. Since I can't deny the existence of Golden Thread X, that can't be moved that can be moved at will and attack people. I can either accept that this mysterious weapon exists, or else I'll have to accept that this was a murder committed with magic. To find the next corpse, I had to go out through the back door and search around outside a bit. Behind the mansion, in the wild-grown bush bushes that were almost swallowed up by the forest, there was something like an old well. And right next to it were Dr. Nanjo and Shannon Chan's corpses. Both corpses had, had their heads smashed, and though they weren't stuck in, there were stakes lying right next to each damaged head. Each corpse was atrocious, but having to look directly at Shannon Chan's lovely face, which had been half blown away, was very painful. Then there was the well. I'd heard that inside it was a secret underground passage to the mysterious mansion, Guadorian. By this time I'd begun to think that Beatrice and her accomplices might have used this underground passage, and left for Kuodorian. Even though there had apparently been at least ten of them, I hadn't seen a trace of anyone. It seemed very likely that they'd already escaped to a different location. There's the typhoon. They can't go out to sea. It goes the same for the forest. 
There's no way they could traverse such a deep, uncultivated forest on foot. In that case, they had only one place to go. The mysterious hidden mansion, Kubadorian. Through the secret underground passage at the bottom of the well. By this time, I had entirely lost my fear of being killed if I had happened to come across the enemy. Don't fuck with me. This time I'll storm into your mansion. Ah, uh, what the hell? Damn it. The old well had a firm cover on it. The cover was an iron grill. The gaps between the bars were perhaps 20 centimetres across. You could peer inside, but it really wasn't something a human could pass through. If I hadn't known better, I wouldn't have thought it anything more than a simple cover to prevent falls. But from what Curious Anna told me, I knew that its purpose was to prevent intruders from entering the secret underground passage in its depths. But the cover was extremely firm and rigid, and no matter how much I pushed or pulled, I couldn't even get close to opening it. I couldn't find any obvious lock. It might be sealed by some mechanism, and no matter how much I investigated it, I couldn't find anything to release it. The biggest piece of information Curious Anna tried to give me, gambling her final moments, was the underground passage in this well. Don't think I'll be stopped by something like this cover. I'll smash it to bits. I'll search for a tool. I had an idea. After all, I'd seen the various tools in the garden and shed when we'd locked Goda-san and Kumasawa-san in there. But the shutter to the garden and shed was locked. On top of that, the key was with Goda-san, who's dead on the inside. In other words, this garden and shed was a closed room. There's no way to open it from the outside. In that case, I've got to break the shutter. There has to be a tool for that somewhere. Kind of feels like I'm going in circles here. <laughs> then while searching for that, I learned that the source of the stench that had permeated the mansion this whole time was the underground boiler room. The boiler room was dimly lit, humid, smelled horrible, and on top of all that was incredibly creepy. But there were several large tools there, and I managed to find a fire axe and some massive wire cutters. And grandfather's corpse. No, strictly speaking, I should probably say that I found a burnt corpse of a person who was probably grandfather. Someone's corpse had been stuffed into the blazing fires of the boiler. However, by coincidence, I was able to notice the number of toes on the corpse. Both feet had six toes. That's right. I think I heard it from Dad sometime long ago. Something about grandfather having polydactyly with extra toes. According to old Ashuramaya family tradition, it seems that those with extra fingers or toes had some kind of good fortune, were treated as a good, good omen. And because of that, Grandfather was selected to be the successor or something. But I wonder if I can be certain this is Grandfather's body, just from the number of toes. After all, Grandfather was supposed to be the leader of the group of culprits. I didn't have a clue why he'd stuffed, uh, get stuffed into a boiler in a place like this and die. A mysterious corpse, burning and spitting out a terrible stench amid the flames. If it really was Grandfather, did that mean that the leader of the group of culprits wasn't Grandfather, but that Beatrice after all? Grandfather was used because he was convenient, and was then thrown away. Unfortunately, it didn't look like I'd be given the chance to hear Grandfather's side of the story. Now that I had obtained a tool, I thought about rushing to take on the cover to the well, but I decided to break the shutter to the garden and shed first. I had plenty of time to kill anyway. I figured I should check on the condition of Godasan's and Kumasawa-san's corpses. I hit the shutter with the axe, breaking into it. Stuck the wire cutter into the crack and scissored it around, opening up a hole. Then I faced Goda San Kumasawa San's corpses once more. As a result, I learned a new fact. First, they had not died by being hung by the neck. Both of their feet were solidly on the floor. And on both of their foreheads were signs that they'd been shot with a gun. The loop seemed longer than a normal noose. On top of that, the length was different on each of, to match the height of each person. In other words, the lengths had been adjusted so that both Godasan, who was tall, and Kumasawa-san, who was short, had their feet solidly but barely on the ground. Also, while the ropes carried both of their weights as their heads lolled, <laughs> both of them had some slack below their knees. This meant that if they'd stood up with their loops around their necks, there would have been some extra length. In other words, these loops would have, wouldn't have been that great for hanging people. The direct cause of death was probably a shot to the head. It was gruesome. Their insides were still dripping out from those gaping holes, staining their faces a deep red. It's probably best to assume that they were then hung, pulled up, and left exposed like that. If they'd been shot with a gun, they would probably have been lying down on the floor. If that had been the case, 
you wouldn't have been able to tell they were dead, even if you peeked through the window. The amount of stuff would have gotten in the way, so if they'd been lying down, they would have been hidden. To make the deaths of these two known to the rest of us, who couldn't go inside, they would have had to have hanged them like this, making it visible from the outside. It was this done to get back at us for thinking that those two would surely be safe if we left the key with them? I wonder where the shutter key we gave Goda Sam, which should have ensured their safety, is now. That key was in the pocket of his trousers. The gardening shed key had been kindly left there, and even the plate was attached. In other words, the gardening shed had been a closed room after all. And that gave rise to another question. Because this can't be explained by a hanging. If they didn't commit suicide, then those nooses were set up by the culprit. It might have been possible to shoot them through the window, but it's really unthinkable that someone could have tied two loops to the beam from outside. And furthermore, there's no, wo there's no way they could have lifted up the heavy corpses. In other words, to do all this, they would have had to go inside. But the key was in Godasan's pocket, and the shutter had been locked. In other words, the gardening shed had been a closed room. Godasan had said that there was only one key to the shutter. But is it possible that there was a copy, and that the culprit was in possession of it? If we're allowed to theorise that there actually was a duplicate of the gardener's storehouse key, and that Godasan just didn't know about it, then this isn't even close to a closed room. Why is it that, despite the fact that almost all the other corpses were shot to death, and left almost completely alone? Just these two corpses were intentionally hoisted up. I couldn't help but feel something a bit odd about that. After this, if we assume that the mystery corpse in the boiler was grandfather's, the deaths of 16 people have been confirmed. There were 18 people on the island. I'm here, and there were 16 corpses. Canon Kuhn's corpse is the only one I haven't been able to confirm. According to Kiryasan, he had been killed while climbing out of the well, and had fallen down into it. So with the well closed up like this, it's impossible to check. I tried shining a flashlight through the bars, down into the darkness in the depths of the well. But it seemed that the jet black darkness had no intention of showing me its depths with a light of that level. It looked like I'd have to break the bars after all. Using the axes and things I'd dragged from the boiler room and the gardening shed, I tried breaking the cover of the well. But the metal bars were extraordinarily sturdy, and breaking them wasn't easy. I hit them with the axe over and over, until my hands started feeling weird, and eventually gave up on breaking them. It's impossible. If there were at least wood, I might have been able to break them. But there's metal. That's right, there's no way you can slice through metal bars like butter with a human strength. I can't even begin to understand that story about how Cannon couldn't cut through metal bars. I heard that a light like a red laser beam grew out of his arm, and that he sliced through the metal bars like he was cutting through butter. Cutting through metal bars like butter? And what's with the red laser beam? Does that mean he secretly had a burner on him or something? And used that to burn through the bars? Still, just what kind of laser could cut through metal bars like butter? It almost sounds like the kind of laser beam you'd find in those robot anime I'd loved as a kid, doesn't it? Does something like that actually exist? How did Cannon can get that laser beam? No matter how much I want to ask him, he's already been killed. Plus, even his corpse is now in the depths of the well, beyond this cover. If Cannon could, sl could slice through metal bars, I'm sure he could handle this metal cover, cover in a single swing. It feels just like the closed room Godasan was locked in while holding the key. Only one person can open the door, but they're locked inside. If only I had the power of Cannon Kun's, I'd be able to do something about this cover myself. Just who is Cannon Kun? He couldn't really be a non-human being capable of using a strange power, right? Kiryasan told me to believe in witches, and I even met an insane woman calling herself one. Could Cannon Kun possibly be a human on the witch's side? Or else? The culprit? What the heck? Am I going to start treating him like the culprit, just because I can't find his corpse? Oh, treating him like the culprit because there's no corpse? Who was the one babbling about the suspicious being innocent? Very well, I couldn't bear having you push all the crimes on Cannon and building a human culprit theory that way. I'll guarantee it with the red. Cannon is dead. Among the five people in Kyrie's group, he was the first to die. In short, he was the ninth victim. Since there's no corpse, I can't say for sure. The Cancun is dead. So my whispering in red does not reach the piece you. But it did reach you, right? Yeah, reached us. 
So all that all said is just that everyone's dead except for Battler. I guess. And maybe the culprit or... You know. At a glance, this was a mass murder due to something strange that could only be thought of as magic. Golden threads that attacked through keyholes. No, we even have testimony that something gold flew around the dining hall when the first six died. The two might have seen, uh, been the same weapon. Then there was the closed room murder of the garden shed and the laser beam that could cut metal bars. And that wasn't all. There was much, much more, like the group of goat monsters. The story of a witch who could create pitfalls just by snapping her fingers. The rabbit-like demons who had fired golden threads. I think there was more, but each part was all screwed up. I couldn't possibly accept it, and was forced to suspect that it was some kind of trick or mistake. But why in the world had everyone spoken with one voice, saying the same thing without contradictions in their testimony? It's not only the magic. This movie is mysterious death. Why well, Jessica knew that George and Nikki had been killed. The mysterious burnt corpse that I couldn't confirm really belonged to that damn geezer. And more and more. All stuff I don't get. I tilted the wine bottle up and gulped. I don't have a clue what's going on. After dinner last night, the kids were chased out and told to go back to the guest house. And then there was a massacre in the dining hall. Curious and the rest were dropped through pitfalls and captured. Then Jessica and George and Iki were called out to take a test or whatever and killed. Even though Curious Anne's group was able to escape the dungeon somehow, all of them got killed in the end. And at the very, very end, even Maria was killed, leaving me all alone. In short, I did nothing except stay locked up in the guest house. During that time, a huge incident occurred and ended. What can I call it? Except incomprehens incom incomprehensible. <laughs> I don't have a clue anymore. No, I'm nothing but a drunk. You plan on leaving only me alive? Show yourself right away and come to kill me already. It's too much of a pain, so I won't search for you. You show me as true form yourself. I won't run or hide, so come at me with arrows or bullets or whatever. I haven't got any sleep since yesterday, so I'm incredibly sleepy. You wanna kill me? Go ahead. I said to return to the guest house and boldly rest in the bed. I next did the kitchen and passed through the lobby. That portrait of the witch came into view. The big clock did too. It's almost exactly midnight. Then the sound of the bell rang out, proclaiming that midnight had arrived. As I listened, I looked up at Beatrice's portrait. Exactly 24 hours ago, I met you. What were you trying to say? Where did you go? Just who in the world are you? Golden Witch Beatrice, I haven't solved a single one of the riddles surrounding you. Show yourself, and fight me. Then the witch showed herself. Like a guest of honour finally appearing, she showed herself on the landing at the top of the big staircase. So you finally show yourself. I've been kept bored for a whole day. Correct. I gave you a whole day. Was that enough for you to fully exercise the rights of the human side? Yeah. I was bored after all. I did a heck of a lot of it. Angie was a good piece. Don't you speak Angie's name. She appeared through a miracle, sacrificed herself and gave you the tenacity required for certain victory. Don't you speak Angie's name. That brutal death was something you needed. If you hadn't seen that death, you wouldn't have grown serious. Without the wake-up call of Angie's ill-fated future, your tenacity for victory would not have been born. I told you not to speak Angie's name. In short, she was a necess necessary sacrifice. Otherwise, an anger great enough to kill me would not have been born in you. The rivalry between us cannot be destroyed. Damn you, Lady Burncastle. It's more fitting to call that a trump card than a piece. No matter how much a piece acts, it does not stray from the board. But no matter how much power a trump card wields, it's always thrown away after it's used. Angie was truly a good trump card for you. Don't you speak Angie's name? A battler's angry roar, Beto finally stopped talking. You know, I don't have time to play around in a place like this anymore. Even a tire will keep Angie waiting. So I'll break through you, take my family, and go back home. I won't waste a second playing witch, ga witch games with you. In that case, what should you do? You know, don't you? Yeah. I'll beat you down. I'll blast away all witches, magic, illusions, delusions. Come on, let's get started. I won't let you trick me again. Resume the game, okay? I'll tear apart the witch's veil, concealing the outright lie you are. You talk too much. All you have to do is honestly say, I'll kill you. Yeah. If those are the words you want, I'll say them. This is the first and last witch of yours that I'll lend an ear to. I thank you. I'll... I'll kill you. 
Very well. Let's begin, battler. Yes, the time for the witch hunt has come. Try and chase me. Try and corner me. Try and kill me. I expect a lot from you. Try and show me what your little sister gave you in her last moments. Bring it on. Battler's cry burned the world with a white light. And if you opened your eyes amidst the darkness, the two of them could be seen in a rose garden. Who shall make the first move? Me. How bold. In the rose garden, beautiful rose petals danced. The colour of those rose petals was red. Did the fact that they faced each other in this beautiful rose garden prove or make claim to a red single truth? That must be why the roses are red. But in the language of flowers, roses represent passion, not truth. The flower for truth is a forget-me-not, and that flower is blue. I'll bore through everything with my blue truth, from the very beginning of everything. I'll start from the very first game. Very well. Let's see what you got. Come. Here I go. I've already proclaimed it, but I'll say it again. This isn't just for the murder of Dr. Nandra in the last game. This will tear apart every scene from every game since the beginning. Ishiramaya Kinzo is already dead, so the true number of people on the island is 17. By adding in an unknown person X, that makes 18 people. By supposing the existence of this person X, the crime is possible even if all 17 people have alibis. By this, even though the number of people reaches 18, it's still possible for culprit X to exist and carry out crimes, even if all 18 people seem to have alibis. You can break through all of the murders in episode 1 by supposing an unknown person X. Furthermore, it's even possible to explain the mystery of Kinzo's evaporation from the closed room sealed by the receipt, by making the bold assumption that Kinzo wasn't there in the first place, unless Beto counters this with the red truth. The illusion of the witch from episode 1 has been completely smashed. This blue truth is valid. The wedge of blue truth the battler had thrown stabbed right through the top of Beto's left foot. Was the red blood pouring out from there a protest being made by her red truth? Beto shut one of her eyes tight, enduring the unbearable pain of the blue truth that denied her. Not bad. I mustn't be denied yet. I mustn't be killed yet. This is not yet enough. In the subsequent games, there are mysteries that couldn't be explained with that alone, right? Which mysteries? In the final stages of the second game, George took Goda and Shannon with him, barricaded them in Natsui's room and was killed. The key that unlocked Natsui's room was locked up inside the room, and all the remaining keys that could unlock the door were in Rosa's hand. Even if a couple of decks existed, it should have been impossible to construct that closed room. The blue wedge that PSB does shook. She was resisting, fighting to pull it out. No, that doesn't shake my blue truth. If Culprit X were to obtain a master key, that's not even close to a closed room. No, it's impossible for the culprit to obtain one. All of the master keys were under Rosa's control. That's meaningless if Aunt Rosa was the culprit. Aunt Rosa handed her key over to Culprit X by some method, assisting in the closed room murder. And after that, she retrieved the key by a similar method. Too naive, Beto. I'd already guessed that much at the time. Yes, you did, didn't you? The wedge that had been gradually loosened in sparkle had seemed as though it was about to be pulled out. Regained its strong blue again thanks to Battler's additional blue truth and dug into Beto again, eating into her foot. Beto let out a cry of anguish at that pain. Not yet. This is still nothing. Not yet. Not yet. Onto the third game. The six linked closed rooms, the murders of Aunt Rosa and Maria, Dad and the rest's deaths in the hall, the murders of Uncle Krauss and Aunt Natsui. All of that can be explained if we suppose that Aunt Eva was the culprit. This argument was already won back then. And even that final riddle you proposed through Eva. The murder of Dr. Nandro can be explained with an 18th unknown person X. That breaks through the whole third game. Can you come to that? Gah. Of course. This much is nothing to worry about. In that case, how do you explain George's disappearance from the guest house? I shall add to the red truth. George did not go down the stairs of the guest house. He flew out through the window. <laughs> In the final stage of the third game, George suddenly vanished from the second floor of the guest house. Eva, who had been on the first floor, claimed that no one had come downstairs. But because of the blue truth, George could have snuck down to the first floor and escaped while Eva was busy carrying Krauss's and Natsui's corpses outside. But by adding an additional red truth, Beto had denied that possibility. To go outside without going down the staircase to the first floor, he would have had to leave by the window. But all the windows had been locked from the inside. So what? Just like you said. He flew out the window, right? It was alone, 
so he couldn't tell if he jumped down. It was raining so hard. Any light tracer would, traces would have disappeared. I'll use the red truth again. All windows and doors leading to the outside were locked from the inside. Furthermore, it's impossible to lock any of those from the outside. George had no technique by which to lock them. I'll use more of the blue. I said it myself at the time. In that case, everything works out as long as someone locked the window after George and Nikki escaped through it. Nothing difficult about that. Can I not escape after something like this? Beto couldn't remove the blue wedge that was buried into her foot. The fake witch was burned more and more by that forceful blue. There's still nothing that shakes my blue truth in any of the first three games. In that case, the only game that can prove you're a witch is this game, the fourth game. Since I haven't counted you with the red, that is so. I shall have to prove witches using only this game. Very well. Give me everything you've got. There's nothing strange about the murder of the six people in the dining hall. The 18th person X went wild with a gun and killed everyone. As for the pitfalls, there's a chance that pitfalls truly were hidden there. And it's possible to explain it using Kyrie San's theory, supposing that poison dart shooting device X, which can knock a person out instantly, exists. The murders of George and Iki, Jessica, and those who escaped from the dungeon can also be explained with guns, just like the dining hall. There's nothing strange about it. But I'm sure you've got a counter-attack, right? Bring it on. The greatest sword, this 18th person X, is based on the theory that Kinzo was already dead. I knew you would make that claim. That's why I took Kinzo out of his study. All members in the family conference welcomed that Kinzo, right? All those present at the family conference acknowledged the presence of Kinzo. That's right. The grandfather was seriously ill, bedridden on the verge of life and death, right? If he was so worn out that he looked like a different person, maybe no one would have cared, right? I'll count over this. The grandfather was a different person, a body double. A different person, the relatives mistook for grandfather. Then I'll count over this. No person would mistake Ishiramaya Kinzo by sight. No matter what disguise might be used, they would not mistake Ishiramaya Kinzo by sight. Then I'll use this. In the second game, when you announced with the red truth that there were five master keys, even though there could have been more than five in the first game, you changed the premises of the later games. So it's possible that Kinzo's life or death status was changed for the fourth game alone. Therefore, Kinzo's presence in the fourth game doesn't serve as proof that he was present in the previous games. Therefore, even if we suppose that the six murders in the dining hall were carried out by Grandfather, it contradicts nothing. Let me counter this way. Kinzo's life or death status is the same at the start of all four games. The setup was not different for the fourth game alone. Repeat it. Kinzo was alive at the start time of every game. I refuse to repeat it. I won't answer, Battler. I won't give you the red truth you so desire. Damn, you're standing in my way, Giza. You putting yourself on the line to protect Beatrice, this most beloved witch of yours? Swain, that damn Giza came into view. Is he trying to be some kind of knight, blocking the path between me and Beto? Battler, are you capable of surpassing me? I won't let you reach. I will not let you reach. Not to the Golden Witch's height, you see. Your thoughtless reasoning cannot surpass even me alone. Die! Kinzo's jet black robe spread as though it would swallow the world. Become the snout of a vast black dragon that came at me, trying to swallow me in one gulp. Faced with that black dragon's roar, I calmed my breathing and closed my eyes lightly. I swallow you up in a single gulp. Disappear, inexperienced fool. Quiet, you damn and dying ghost. Oh, so you call me a ghost? Do you intend to see it through to the end, this theory that I'm already dead? That will prove fatal to you. Be swallowed up by the first twilight of the fourth game and disappear. The black dragon's vast mouth, its snout, its fangs, swallowed Battler whole. In that instant, Battler suddenly opened his eyes. Thanks, Beatrice. Your third game became a foothold for my counter-attack. What? See ya, damn geezer. This is goodbye. As a basis for claiming that Kinzo is dead, even in the fourth game, I propose the following theory. Very well, come with all you have, my descendant. Here I go, you damn geezer. My theory is that the name of Kinzo gets passed on as the title of the Ashuramaya family head. Ashuramaya Kinzo was already dead, and he passed that name on to someone else. Everyone acknowledged that. That way, all of those present at the family conference acknowledged the presence of Kinzo. There wasn't even any need for someone to disguise themselves as grandfather, because everyone acknowledged a new Kinzo so they didn't actually mistake Kinzo by sight.
As long as this theory is not denied, nothing can change the fact that you're dead. This is the final blow. Damn geezer, I demand that you repeat it. Among all the people there, not one had multiple different names. I cannot. Oh. Rest in peace, damn geezer. Thank me. You are finally able to die. This is your requiem. Take it and drop dead. I sure my kinso was already dead. That's right, you definitely deserve to be pitied, since whenever we find your corpse, it's always completely burnt. That was a device to hide the fact that time had passed since your death. Then you pass that name on to someone else. With this theory, even though you were dead, Kinzo was able to appear at the family conference. How's that? This is a checkmate. So there was another Kinzo. It's just like a, a, a title rather than a name. Several dozen blue stakes bored into Kinzo's ghost. The terrible destructive power wouldn't let the ghost recover again. Beatrice. Kinzo, thank you for everything. Rest in peace. I'll not forget my time spent with you. Dispersing along with the shadow of the black dragon as golden flower petals scattered, Ashurmaya Kinzo became a gold-coloured cyclone and disappeared. Even after death, he had fought for the sake of the woman he'd loved. There's no doubt in that your love and madness were the real thing. Battler. Don't hate me. Let the dead sleep. Don't wake them. You're up next. This is the end for you too. Beetle still couldn't pull out the blue wedge that pierced her foot. She realised that she was on the verge of death. I've gone along with you a whole bunch. I think I've more than fulfilled any responsibility I had to play with you. But it's about time to finish things up. I've got a lonely little sister waiting at home. Let me take my leave with my whole family. Then kill me. In that case, try and kill me. I won't run or hide, and by now, I won't even be able to avoid it. Come on, I'll assure my uh, battler. You got it. With the 18th person X from the Kinzo was dead theory, everything that remained has been pierced through. George and Iki and Jessica's deaths in the fourth game can also be explained by Culprit X, and the five who escaped from the dungeon and were killed, and the two in the gardening shed and Maria in the end. All of those can be explained with 18th person X. There's nothing strange there at all. With this, I fully explained the culprit using humans for all games. Beatrice, this is Checkmate. Wah. Beatrice, who couldn't dodge, had several blue stakes driven into her and was skewered. Beto grabbed at them, trying to pull them out somehow. Ah, that got me. It hurts. This'll kill me, won't it? If I don't pull these out, I'll die. I've had enough of the pain. I've had enough of the anguish. With both hands, Beto firmly grasped one of the blue stakes. Naturally, the power of the witch denying blue truth burned her hands. Unable even to hide her tears at the pain, Beto howled and tried to pull the stakes out with all her might. If I can't pull these out, I'll die. This is my final counterattack. Then, Battler, how do you explain my several acts of magic? The very first time those appeared was in the second game, when I fixed Maria's pumpkin marshmallow. At that time, Rosa definitely witnessed that magic. Certainly at that time, Rosa witnessed gold butterflies gathering and the fixing of a marshmallow by the miracle of magic. Rosa alone witnessing it isn't very credible, right? That's why I increased the number of witnesses to the uppermost limit later on, which is what happened in this last game. The summoning of my minions, and brutal murders due to magic. All those were witnessed by a great many people. That's itself proof that my magic exists. How do you explain that, assure my battler? Stalemate. What? Magic exists because magic exists. Didn't the rules of our brawn tube trial say that you couldn't use that kind of argument? Yes, you're right. No matter who or how many people witness magic, that cannot become a proof of magic existence. Whether all the magic you've shown exists or not, I can ignore it all and explain things with humans. That's my undeniable right. Am I wrong? At those words, the blue stakes let out an even bright delight, knocking my hands away. Seems I can't pull them out after all. As battler is now, even if I pull up a witness for each individual bit of magic and demand an explanation, you'd probably use some kind of move to deny all of them. Not just the magic with the marshmallow I showed Rosa, but all the miracles of magic. 
so I can no longer even claim to be a witch without questioning him about something like how a marshmallow was fixed. I'm in such an inferior position that I must fight over such trivialities. It may be impossible for me. I know that. This was to be a game without victory from the very beginning. So it was only natural that the day of my defeat would eventually come. Have I fought up until today just to lose to Battler? I began the game, thinking I might be able to win. Even if I wouldn't be able to win easily, I believed that in a game repeating endlessly, a miracle would eventually occur. After all, I had certain willpower on my side, an unwavering desire to win with certainty. However, I've now lost that miracle completely, and that certain willpower resides in Battler, leaving me certainly without even a one in a million chance at a miracle. Or perhaps I should say, I've been left without a miracle or certainty. I will have no victory and no end through a tie. The only resolution allowed me is to continue on resisting until defeat is given to me in this game. That's right, I am fighting, only to be killed by Battler. I looked into Battler's eyes. That which was reflected inside them wasn't me. The figures of the little sister waiting for his return and the family he had to bring back were reflected in those eyes. To him, my existence is already not even that of an individual. Obviously. From the very beginning, he's been trying to deny the individual that I am. Yes, that last game sure was fun. I was only tricking him a bit. But for just a short period of time, it felt like we understood each other. And that was fun. That's right. I should have made my move then. I should have continued for eternity with Battler still totally fooled. But that's just no good, right? That just won't be true victory. It's a checkmate, Beatrice. Peter had been run through with several blue stakes, skewered over and over to the ground while still standing. Because of that, she wasn't even able to fall over. And still looking up into the sky was sewn in place. That tragic form might have been a fitting end for the cruel witch who had endlessly toyed with 18 people's lives and who had killed constantly for hundreds and thousands of years. Gently, as though someone was mourning over something, rain began to fall. Amid that rain, Beto was soaked and crucified. Is it over, Beto? Can't even let out a squeak. Not yet. You aren't a woman who let things end with just this. Don't be ridiculous. How can you look at this and think that it isn't over? Quickly, deliver the final blow. Just say it, with your blue truth. According to this, witches do not exist. Say it. Just say it. With that single blow, just put a stop to my breathing. It's useless. Hmm. So you would expose me to even further shame? Isn't it settled already? Stand up. Our brawl still isn't over. Not over, you say. That just now wasn't you losing. You just stopped and gave up. Isn't that enough? Wouldn't giving up mean your victory? You should return to your little sister right away. Just throw me away, right here. Didn't I tell you? I won't run away. And I won't let you run away. Just who are you? And what in the world is it that you want? If you want to know, why don't you just try your favourite move? Isn't it better this way, with me as a mere delusion and illusion? Isn't that enough? It's all useless. I won't let you run away. I'll break through you. How could I let you run away like this? I won't let you run back to the darkness of illusions while you're still all hazy like this. I'll break through you. Completely. So stand up. Don't act all frail like that. You're still hiding several moves. I can tell. Why won't you just let me escape? Dad, Mum and Angie. All the cousins and all the relatives. And all the servants. You toyed with them so much and killed them. I definitely won't forget. Won't forgive that inhumanity. I can still feel Angie's arms on my shoulders. I won't forgive your inhumanity, so I won't let you get away like this. Battler's eyes burned with the flames of hatred. The time had so long since passed during which pitiful behaviour would have earned his compassion. After being tricked once, Battler will never sympathise with me again. Instead of the wolves and sheep puzzle, this is like the boy who cried wolf, isn't it? What am I supposed to do? What should I do? Is fighting endlessly only to avoid admitting defeat a fitting endless torture for the endless witch? Is endlessly harassing Battler to avoid giving him victory also part of being the Endless Witch? It's so sad. If Is this what the Endless Magic is? I've had enough. I've had enough of endlessly being toyed with by witches. I will have no victory and no tie. 
In that case, there's only one result that can release me. Since the time I succumbed to the path of witches, since the day I made that contract with demons, it was promised that I would meet my end through tragedy, was it not? What's wrong? Golden Witch Beatrice, if you're the ruler of Rockenjima, show me a majesty fit in for that, even at the very end. Lightning. The world was smashed with white. Fit in last moments for the ruler of Rockenjima. Ha! Still pierced by the blue stakes, Beetle faced the rainy sky and let out a cry of laughter. Then she slowly raised her face and stared at Battler. Fool. Just when I was about to praise your good fight and hand over victory. You shall regret that pride. This isn't something for you to hand over. I'm going to take it from you. The same goes for you, right? You could never accept an easy-going victory where you just say, Maybe witches existing isn't so bad. Isn't that the very reason you intentionally fell apart like that at the end last time? That's right. Last game, you took pity on me just once, didn't you? So now I'll pay back that debt. Stand. My enemy, my golden witch, Beatrice. Fool. You fool. You simpleton. You think you'll get another chance? When Beetle yelled, the blue stakes that had pierced her chest blew to bits and disappeared. However, the blue wedge that had pierced her foot in the very beginning did not vanish. You can't pull it out, Chaz. You can't pull out the blue truth of the 18th person X. I will respond to one thing you told me to repeat. As you reasoned, Kinzo is already dead at the start time for all games. However, this means that you can take one person out. Before now, I proclaimed that no more than 18 humans exist on the island. I will lower that by one for Kinzo. No more than 17 humans exist on the island. That excludes any 18th person. In short, the 18th person X does not exist. This applies to all games. What you know? Looks like you're still hiding some pretty crazy stuff up your sleeve after all. The island, which had no more than 17 humans on it, has been set up to appear as though there were 18. Taking one off makes the 17, so we finally reach the correct number. This way, the wedge I knocked into has been removed. We'll have to start the fight over, back from square one. The blue wedge that had sewn Beto in place broke apart. There was no longer anything piercing her. The scars on her body had disappeared completely. They stood just as Battler had hoped for, the figure of the majestic Golden Witch who ruled Rockinjima. Then come Battler, once more from the beginning, try and break through everything with the blue truth. I too will no longer play, run or hide. If you are worthless, then I shall end this match right here, right now. With my grand victory, I'll make you regret your refusal to compromise for all eternity. Come, start from the first game. Oh, here we go again. <laughs> right. From the first twilight of the first game, there's nothing strange about the murder of the six relatives that were found in the garden and shed at the start. The crime was possible for any of those who didn't have an alibi. Valid. Continue, what about the next closed room murder with Eva and Hideyoshi? Even the chain was set for the closed room. I shall add to the red truth. Both deaths were homicides. It's not the case that after the construction of the closed room, one of them committed suicide after committing murder. Furthermore, the murder was carried out with both the victim and the perpetrator in the same room. No method exists for the perpetrator to commit murder from outside the room. Suppose that the culprit was a human without an alibi. In other words, the dead. We weren't able to identify some of the first six corpses because of their smashed faces. Maybe one was actually a disguised corpse, and Culprit X killed those two after making us think they were a victim and hiding away. Then after the closed room murder was constructed, the culprit hid under the bed and waited for all of us to come and leave. Very well, next. Cannon was killed in the boiler room, correct? I shall add to the red truth. All the survivors have alibis. Let's include the dead as well. 
In short, no kind of human or dead person on the island could have killed Cannon. If no one could kill him, then he might have been the one to kill. Cannon might have killed himself. Repeat it. Cannon did not commit suicide. Cannon did not commit suicide. One more. Repeat it. Cannon death was a homicide. I refuse to repeat it. By that refusal, it may be possible to view it as a homicide, but you've already proclaimed it in red that no one could have killed him. In other words, it was not a homicide. This is the same as the linked closed rooms from the third game. Cannon died for a reason that was neither suicide nor homicide. The details are unknown, but he died due to an accident. Because of the devil's proof, I refuse to explain what kind of blunder could have led to an accidental death where a stake was driven into his chest. Now that you have borrowed the, uh, borrowed the power of demons, you are without peer. It's valid. In that case, what about the murders after that in the parlour of Genji, Nanjo and Kumasawa? Naturally, Maria, who was in the same room, did not kill them. And of course, their three deaths were homicides. We can explain those murders with Culprit X who hid away using an unidentified corpse. After all, those three had their faces smashed. It's completely possible that one of them was a body double corpse. I guarantee the identities of all ident unidentified corpses, therefore there were no body double tricks. And you can explain it with simultaneous murders. Each of them had a gun pointed at clockwise and blew each other's faces off at the same time. After that, Maria collected those guns and hid them. How about that? What? What a ridiculous argument. How amusing. Then what about Natsuhi in the end? I shall add to the red truth. Natsuhi's death was a homicide. There were no unidentified corpses, and all the survivors have alibis. You can explain it with an indirect murder due to Trap X. Something was done to Aunt Natsui's gun. It could have been a trap gun, built to send a bullet right into the forehead for anyone who tried to hold it up and shoot it. The bullet buried into Natsui's forehead was not fired from her gun. It's possible that Aunt, Nats Aunt Natsui was lured out by that letter, whose contents were unknown. She was called out into the hall. Then she was forced to stand in a specified location at a specified time and murdered by Trap X, which used a gun that had been installed there beforehand. Wonderful. These reckless arguments of yours are even starting to feel pleasurable now. Out of respect, I shall hand the first game over to you. Well done. The instant Beto acknowledged her defeat in the first game, the stakes of the blue truth once again pierced her chest, letting out a terrible sound. This is still hardly painful. It's not over yet. Come now for the second game. Okay, two seconds. Beto just pull barely pulled out the stakes that had pierced her chest. But even though there was no hole left behind, she still seemed to be bearing a deep wound that was letting out a massive amount of blood. And she was tormented by an equally fierce pain. But Beto grinned, grinding her teeth and pushed for the next game to start. But I won't feel sympathy for her. Just by her existing there, we've been killed and harassed over and over. And Angie's been burdened with a future of isolation. Correct, just by my being here and laughing, this eternal hell will continue. It won't give your little sister back. Let her cry over the family that shall not return for the next thousand years. Damn it. No compassion, no mercy. On to the second game. I'll start with the first crime. Right after it happened, I penetrated to the truth of the closed room murder where the six were killed in the chapel. Someone secretly borrowed Maria's key and secretly returned it to Maria's bag after the crime was over. From the time Maria received her key to the instant Rosa unsealed the envelope the next day, the key passed through no one's hands. That door might have had an auto lock, just like Gramps study. In other words, it was unlocked before the crime, with a rock or something wedged in so that it couldn't close completely. Then someone gave the key to Maria. The lock was automatic, so it possible, it's possible to make a theory where the key wasn't needed. There were no doors with auto locks other than Kinzo's study. The victims locked the door from the inside. One of the six was the culprit, and this person killed the other five, then pretended to be dead. The six were already dead by the time they were discovered. All of their deaths were homicides. All six were genuine victims and did not take part in a mutual murder. There was no simultaneous murder. There were people, Kumasawa-san in particular, who had no alibi at the time. If you assume that someone was hiding in on the inside, we've got no problems. There was no one hiding in the chapel. Therefore, the shut-in murder you suggest does not work. What's wrong? Is that all the Shomaya battler? It's not so easy once you get to the second game, right? 
It was a thundering exchange of red and blue truth. The stakes and wedges of blue truth that I sent flying attacked one after the other, and Beto cut them down one after another with her red truth, her red treasured sword, knocking them down. But then blood she'd lost from the first game was probably serious. This intense exercise was putting an even greater strain on her. I could also see her breath grow ragged. That's why I can't hold back now. I'll corner that witch. This time I'll break through her. Not yet. It's useless. It's all useless. My twisted logic isn't finished yet. What about this? The food they were given had small bombs in it, which exploded from inside their stomachs. In other words, the crime was possible through Trap X. The exact nature of bombs they could swallow without notes in, and which could also blow open their stomachs as devil's proof. I refuse to explain. <laughs> what the hell is that? Small bombs? Pepito failed to knock down the blue wedge as it flew at an angle like a breaking pitch. It let out a loud thunk and gouged itself deep into her left shoulder. However, even as the breaking pitch hit her, her laughter didn't seem to be stopping. I get it. Even I think that theory's pretty screwed up. Huh, laugh as much as you want. Got a problem with that? None. Quite a pleasurable, reckless argument. Next up's the closed room with Jessica and Cannon. No problems there. If the culprit was one of the servants, they could have used the master key. It's not even a closed room. After that, there was an attack in the servant room from a mystery person who seemed to be Cannon, and Nanjo and Kumasawa were killed, right? It already proclaimed Cannon's death in red before that time. So who was that Cannon? If Cannon Kun's death was proclaimed with a red, there's no way he was alive. Therefore, there's a chance that the one who attacked that group was in a disguise that made everyone mistakenly think it was Cannon Kun. They would never mistakenly think any other person was Cannon. And just like the hereditary, uh, heredity of Kinzo's name, there's a possibility that Cannon's name was inherited by someone. You could suppose that Cannon Kun was killed, a different person succeeded that name, and that this person attacked them. A sound like a watermelon being squashed rang out, and a blue wedge was buried deep into Beto's left flank. Maybe it hit in a bad place, since it seemed to be really effective. After leaning over and moaning for a while, she laughed it off as though trying to make it seem like no big deal. I get it. That must have hurt a lot. <laughs> Once again, you've set up some human as the culprit, as if it were nothing. You truly are gabbing on about things you'd never be able to open your mouth and say on the game board. Yet it's valid. That reckless argument is pleasurable. Truly pleasurable. This isn't pain, it's pleasure. When Beto howled, the wedge that had pierced her was blasted away. But the wound remained, and she continued to be tormented by a fierce pain. You ready? I'll keep going. My blue truth for the last murder in the second game, the three who died in Aunt Natsui's room, should still be valid even with the 18th person X denied. Do you have a counter argument for that in red? If you don't, the second game is all mine too. I don't. Fighting over such trivial matters bores me. I'll give it to you. I'll give you the second game. The instant she acknowledged her loss in the second game, two blue stakes gouged through Beto's chest this time. The witch's lungs were gouged, as were her intestines. Her face twisted in anguish. Her body twisted as she gasped in pain. Does it hurt? Hurt? No, no, this just tickles. At least compared to having your entire body torn to bits and turned into a pile of scrap meat, like your sister. I'll make you scrap meat too, then your siblings can all be mixed together like ground beef and pork. <laughs> I'll beat you to death, I'll tear you to bits the same way. Next, the third game. How long are you going to sit around all worn out like that? Everyone just started knocking you down to hell. Naturally, is just something like this could weigh me down. You're right, we're still just getting started. Come, let's begin the third game, starting with the sixth link to closed rooms. You supposedly did penetrate this closed room at the time, but then you killed off Kinzo. At the time, I theorised that Gramps was the culprit, and that after killing the other five and stringing the keys across each room, he constructed his own closed room on the boiler room. And that day, he died in an accident while carrying out some kind of scheme, burning to death in the boiler. But now I've declared that Gramps was already dead, so I've denied my own theory myself, ironically enough. However, there's no problem. Plenty of people besides Gramps could have committed the crime. 
You could even claim that all the adults holding the family conference were in on it. All five master keys were discovered, each in the pocket of one of the servants. The individual room keys were found inside envelopes alongside the corpses. In short, all keys related to the linked closed rooms were inside the linked closed rooms. No key could have been returned from outside the room, using the crack of the door, the crack of the window, vents, or any piece of, uh, place of the sort. Then they were killed with poison gas. Even if a key couldn't pass through, gas could, right? The murder was carried out from outside the closed room. All of them had what appeared to be gunshot wounds that were fatal. Murdering them from outside the room would have been impossible. I shall say more with the red. When the five other than Kinzo were killed, the killer was definitely in the same room as them. I already proclaimed in red at the time that there was no suicides. After the murder of each person in their respective rooms, the culprit created a linked closed room. But the culprit had no way to return, just the key to the very last room. And yet they were able to do it. After all, the first person to discover a corpse just had to pretend to find the key and pull it from the pocket of one of the corpses. She couldn't fully block the retort to that blue stake. Peter was pushed back by the blue wedges that were unleashed on her one after another, finally failed to block one and once again took a severe wound. As she howled in pain, she pulled out the blue wedge that had pierced her right arm. Beto's entire body had been torn apart and pierced with blue wedges, stakes and blades over and over again. And now she was totally covered in blood. But even so, Beto grinned, cackling as though this was amusing. How could a man who promised to bring Angie's parents home voice a theory where those parents are culprits? Splendid. Even that's just fine, right? Go be a big happy family together. Uh, getting their hands dirty with mass murder. Then return to Angie stained with blood that will never come off. How could we expect anything less from the people who returned alive from the Witch's Island? Just what that mincemeat Angie needs. Shut up. I'll kill you. I'll tear you apart. No need to waste your time begging for your life. I'll definitely give you the worst kind of death by my own hands. Yes, you probably could do it. I've explored the depths of cruelty for over a thousand years. And you probably will gift me with a fitting end for all that. Does that hurt? Is it harsh? Or does it tickle? Is that supposed to torment me? Come on, I'll show my battler. There's still mysteries left. Beto had already counted my first powerful move, the 18th person axe, by making the number of people on the island 17. But just limiting the number of people to 17 didn't overturn the theory that Aunt Eva was the culprit. I can crush most of the murders in the third game this way. Blood dripped from all over the body of the Golden Witch. I cornered her, this time thoroughly without mercy. This isn't the game played to decide who wins and who loses. We aren't playing. Even the time I spend playing and fighting like this delays my trip home. In her isolation, Angie will continue to have her heart torn apart by loneliness and sadness. I have to go back to Angie as fast as I can. You're all worn out. Standing at death's door, are you? It still doesn't burden me. Something like this. It tickles. Looks like you don't need any mercy. I never asked for it in the first place. I'm going all out. Do so. When our roles were reversed, I showed no mercy. So you ought to do the same when given the chance. Otherwise, I'll summon another isolated Angie from a different world. And this time, I'll tear off her arms and legs, stick her with a spear and roast her, okay? Shut up. Never again. Not my family. Not my relatives. Not any of the servants. I won't let you make them your playthings. I've already broken through all of the mysteries in the fourth game of the Blue Truth. The only one left is the very last one from the third game. Only the murder of Dr. Nanjo. Oh, have I already been cornered so far? What a precarious state I'm in. She coughed violently, spitting up blood. The insides have been punched through so many times. It was only natural. In other words, the mystery of Dr. Nanjo's murder is the last line of defense for you, being a witch, right? As you say, if you defeat that, it will mean that all my mysteries have been defeated. Unless I counter one of your truths with some new rare truth, or present a new mystery, I'll die. You don't look like someone who's been pushed, in, pushed into a corner standing on the brink. You still have some kind of hidden pitch up your sleeve, right? Well, who knows? I've already tired of a too long life after a thousand years. I'm sad to think that having this life ended by a rival like you, whom I stumbled upon at the very end, might not be so bad. 
You can do it, can't you? Do it. I beg you, kill me. I'm always the one killing, and I've never had the experience of being killed. I've killed the 18 of you hundreds of times, but I haven't been killed myself even once. So I wanted to experience it just once myself. It was a graceless show of boldness, unchanged from before. But blood dripped from her mouth, her once beautiful dress was covered with holes. Blood poured from all over her body, making her physical appearance stand in sharp contrast to her attitude. Maybe the shot she'd taken to the flank was still tormenting her, since she was still pressing down on it, unconsciously, without a trace of grace. I've got no time for pity. As long as I feel sympathy for this witch, my family and I won't be released from this place. Until I defeat her, we won't be able to go home. In the outside world, it may be possible for even enemies to understand each other when circumstances change. But pure evil does exist. Evil that brings misfortune just by existing, and is to be spared no compromise. Just by its continued existence alone, it's evil. I don't pity you. Just like how you didn't show pity for any of us. Well, of course. All of you are just pieces in the game. It's just unbelievably fun to think about which six to kill in the beginning, how to kill the next two, and whether I can find a much, much more grotesque method of murder, you see? Hey battler, I've reformed a little, so forgive me this time too. If you do, I'll change my methods of killing into something a little better, okay? I'll listen to how you want them to be killed, and in what order, got it? It's so fun toying with people's lives. I'm sure you could think of a way to turn Angie into a pile of scrap meat much, much more thoroughly. Come battler, try to expose the truth of an Andrew's murder. The 18th person X has been defeated, but I won't give in. I'll stop that which is breathing cold. The end of the third game. It was announced in red that the survivors at that point in time, Bala, Eva, Jessica, and Nanjo, were all uninvolved with Nanjo's murder. It was also proclaimed that he was murdered directly by someone before his eyes. All other people had the strongest possible alibi by having their deaths proclaimed in red. I'll break th through this without using the 18th person X. Think, don't stop thinking. The red doesn't only bind me, it's also supposed to be a weak point. I've got to somehow use it against her. That's right, there's still a gap. This way I can break through it. This way Beatrice's Legend of the Witch is finished. True, the others probably were dead. However, their deaths were not proclaimed in red at the instant Dr. Nanjo died. Strictly speaking, it was in the fight between me and Eva after Dr. Nanjo's corpse was found. In other words, if someone was alive at the time Dr. Nanjo was killed, and then died before Eva made that proclamation, you can solve right through that crack. In other words, it's like this. Someone who was first confirmed dead by Eva's proclamation was a culprit. They cleverly played dead earlier and waited for us to come and go. Before their death was announced in red, we were made to think that they died. Then they killed Dr. Nanjo and later died for some reason. After that, Eva proclaimed their death in red. That theory can explain Dr. Nanjo's case. How's that, Beatrice? When he forcefully asked that question, there was a terrible sound that could only be likened to that of a compressor. And a blue stake that was as thick as a log appeared from under the earth and skewered the golden witch Beatru uh, Beto, pulling, out, pulling her up into the air. Ugly tearing sounds rang out, and each time a blue stake or wedge would appear and pierce Beatrice's body. When that finally ended, her tragic form was exposed there, pink cushioned by more than ten stakes and wedges all over her body and dripping with blood, dangling, with, dangling and crucified. There was none of the dignity of the brutal witch who had sneered at the honour of the dead and toyed with and killed hundreds of the living. The vein, which had started falling at some point, quietly tormented the crucified witch. As Battler heaved with his breathing, he waited for some kind of answer from the golden witch. Although it wasn't long, it took the witch a bit of time to show any signs of life. It hurts. It hurts. You got what you deserved. Now you can experience a portion of the pain felt by all those you've killed. Even as he said that, it seemed Battler had lost a little of his momentum at this extremely pathetic sight. Even if it was an enemy, he couldn't look straight at a woman exposed in such a brutal fashion. But even so, unless he destroyed Beatrice, this battle wouldn't end. Battler, I beg you. Hmm? Beto let out a sob. It hurts. It really hurts. End it. End it. Even with this, I still can't die. Even though it hurts so much, I still can't die. What are you asking of me? End it. Release me from this pain. Beto's expression was soaked with blood and tears. Battler certainly had been tricked by her at one point, so he was probably able to suspect that her expression, that even her tears were an act. However, Battler believed in those tears. 
After all, those tears had the red of truth mixed in with them. What should I do? What can I do to end your pain? I will now expose everything. This is my heart. Your heart? Kill me, Vito. Kill me. Just let me die. Were those tears from pain and torment, or else? Either way, that pathetic expression was painful for Battler to look at, even after burning with such anger. Quickly, go back to Angie. I listen to your request. Not so that I can go back, but to end your pain. Thank you, Battler. In her last breaths, Beto summoned up all of her remaining strength and managed to close both of her hands into fists. A red light began to gather at those fists. Then she lifted her arms as though appealing to the heavens for something. You'll be able to kill me. All of me. My heart. Crush it. Pierce it. Okay? The red light around both her arms gradually began to strengthen. Plea. After saying that much, her face tilted to the side a bit. Then her right arm lost its light and flopped down. But her left arm alone did not lose its light and remained held out towards the heavens. Then before Battler's eyes, another Beto appeared with a faint form, transparent like a curtain. The crucified Beto had already lost consciousness. However, the newly appeared faint Beto quietly looked at me, her eyes expressionless, and spoke. I show my battler. I will now kill you. And? And right now, there is no one other than you on this island. The only one alive on this island is you. Nothing outside the island can interfere. I understand. This is the last mystery Beatrice will be able to make as a witch. She's trying to offer it to me, entreating me to solve the final mystery and kill her. Do it. I'll accept your final mystery. You are all alone on this island. And of course I am not you. Yet I am here, now, and I'm about to kill you. Like a souped up version of Dr. Nanjo's murder. So? Who am I? Is that your final question? Who am I? Then Beatrice slowly approached me, and still expressionless, held me. I get it, Beto. I'll kill you, don't worry. I also slowly held her head. Then I, as a piece, left the game board. Aha! Uh -huh. That's where the credits are gonna go. <laughs> Weird. <laughs> but who is she? Ashumaya Battler died on the 10th twilight. Ashumaya Angie died in 1998. Maria died on 10th. Sakitaru. <laughs> Kinzo died on the 9th twilight. Krauss died on the 7th, Natsui 1st, Jessica 2nd, Eva 1st, Hideyoshi 1st. It really is sort of drip feeding with the answer, isn't it? as it goes. George 2nd, Rudolf 1st, Kyrie 8th, Rosa 1st, uh, Nanjo 6th, Genji 1st, Shannon 5th, Cannon 4th, Goda 9th, Kumasawa 9th, Eva Beatrice, <laughs> Virgilia, Rana Ray, Gap, Lucifer, Firethun, Satan, all the seven. <laughs> seven stakes. The rabbit sisters, the Chiesta sisters. All the goats. <laughs> Okanogi. Amakusa? I can't read the Kusa very well. Nandro, Kumasawa, Captain Kawabata, Nanda Delta, Bencast also. Yeah, that should be about it, shouldn't it? Yeah. Fourth game, Alliance of the Golden Witch.
Why is it called When They Cry 3 then? Ah, uh, Higurashi must have been the second game, yeah? I've never played or experienced the first game. I'd have to Google what that's all about. I'm not really sure myself. What's happening? Ah, the question marks. So, achievement unlocked. The end. <laughs> So the question marks, I know I said we were going to do it all in one episode, but this has been a huge episode. And you never know the question marks, could be another one that's like an hour and a half, so uh, we, better, uh, we better leave it there for now. And then next time, next time, we will get onto the question marks. So this has been Greeny XI, hope you've enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching, see you again in a bit.